people think that you know mental health is something that is sort of hidden away and and it's great that we're now talking about it and i think that if we can if we can empower people to take action themselves and think about you know what can what small step that can i take today that's going to make me feel better not only today but in the ongoing days and often it's not about radically overhauling your whole life it's about taking these little small actions but, but being consistent. And I think that's something that people in a lot of ways they want to, you know, do big, take radical action, but it's not about radical actions. It's about actually small little steps. Sophie, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And Richard, I'm here as well and very excited uh, to have someone from from the fold uh, of which our family is very familiar with, the ABC. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the, that's the Australian ABC because we have a lot of an American uh, oh, yes. listeners. So. No, yes, notice the accent. <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> but, but Sophie, it, it is. I mean, this. I'm not sure what our listeners will think. So what are we doing? We're talking to a journalist. Uh, yes, because journalists are some of the most important people in presenting and bringing forward the material we do. In some respect, Matt and I are journalists uh, in the sense that we, we ask that. But I really wanted to get... Get you on to give us some insight into what it's like to being because you're sort of like a a, a, a step you know a, a, a part of a series of steps that brings information to both the public and to therapists as well so could you just start off a little bit we've done a little bit of background for you already but what's what's your important highlights what's your story that that you find comfortable for yourself so when i was um younger I actually either wanted to be a journalist or a psychologist they were the two professions that I was really passionate about and it was only that I couldn't do maths that stopped me doing a psychology degree because of my maths wasn't as up to scratch but I what I found is there's actually quite a lot of crossover between psychology and journalism in a lot of ways you you need a lot of the same skills like um, listening skills and empathy and you know being able to understand people's stories and also there's a big crossover for me when it comes to interpreting the science as well, because my job as the medical reporter for ABC has been looking at research, looking at science and being able to translate that uh, for a lay audience and working out what's important for the audience to really understand. And so I've been doing that um, for in my broadcast career but I've also started doing it as well um, with a much greater focus on mental health through social media because I've really noticed in the last two years or really since you know the, the pandemic, there's been a much greater um, desire for people to have the, the, the tools to manage their mental health and have evidence-based ways of managing their mental health. And not everyone has access to see someone in person or even via telehealth. And so I wanted to use my science communication skills that I developed throughout my career to really focus on how can I get good quality information out to uh, the public as much as possible for those people who don't have access to see somebody. And so I've been able to transfer the skills that I've had through my broadcast career into sort of segueing a little bit more into mental health just because I really saw there was such a great desire for people were really people were struggling you know people have struggled over the last few years and you've probably noticed that as well with your or you know with what your audience is telling you but um yeah I've been very um fortunate to be focused on health and science over the last um two decades as a as a health and science communicator for for, for Australian broadcasting. And our goal has been really to, to bring the latest sort of medical breakthroughs um, to, to our audiences, but really looking at it from a quite a critical lens, you know, so not just sort of, you know, looking at a press release and saying, oh, that they're saying this is a breakthrough, well, we better do a story, but really, you know, going going a bit deeper and saying, well, how important is this really? You know, is, is this the breakthrough we've been waiting for or is this just an incremental step in, in the 
development of this, whatever it might be. Because, you know, as we know, science can be quite slow to evolve. You know, things happen in increments rather than massive breakthroughs. So what I've always tended to look for is, you know, what are the the biggest improvements for, for patients? Really, everything I do has a very patient-focused lens to it. So when I'm thinking about a story or a story idea, I'll think, how important is it that that people and patients need to know about this? How significant is it? Is it how much is it going to impact clinical practice? Is it going to change clinical practice? Uh, and 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 do, do the listeners and the readers and the viewers really need to know about this? And so that that's sort of the, the lens that I've I've looked at research over the last few years, and 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 now I look at use the same lens to look at mental health. Yeah. So and it, and I, oh, sorry, Matt, you go. You go. I was just going to say it must take a long time to accumulate the knowledge of you know the the big picture, but also you have to know a lot of technical language. Um, and so I would imagine, like a journalist just coming out of university um, and going headlong into this huge diverse field of health, um, could be a little bit overwhelming. What is I, I'm interested to know what the journey has been like for you to get your head around mm-hmm. this enormous field. Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, if I look back to when I started, God, I probably would hate to look at those stories because I'm not sure that they would have been as informed as you know the more recent ones. But the thing that's been really, two things have really helped. One is I've really been able to uh, gather some amazing sources and some amazing experts that I speak to all the time because you know, as a as a journalist, I'm never going to be the expert on any particular topic, but I have those experts at my fingertips that I can call on to say, how significant is this piece of work? How significant is this research? You know, is this what we've been waiting for or are we waiting for the next study to come along? So having those sources um, has been a huge benefit for me. And then the other thing is really immerse myself in the world of medicine, so reading the journals that that doctors would read, um, being on you know the forums that doctors would be on, and and being in it, in places where doctors and scientists congregate, so that way you're getting first hand information rather than sort of second or third hand, and that's one been one of the great things. I mean, there's lots of downsides with social media, but one of the great things with social media is I can see what doctors and scientists are putting out on different platforms like Twitter or or mainly mainly Twitter. There's lots of scientists on Twitter and LinkedIn to a certain extent. And I can see the issues that, are, that matter to them firsthand. And then so that way I can think, wow, this is something that they're concerned about. I, sh- I should really be focusing my attention on this. And when you see that a number of doctors or scientists are, are concerned about a certain issue, then it's like, okay, this is something we need to look into. Right. Yeah, so like a, a, yeah. a good a good entrepreneur will will gather a lot of experts around about him. He'll have the sort of the, the big picture, but he it'll be the experts that uh, inform as to what what happens. Yeah, but it's cool. a lot about like what we do, Matt, uh, and and what we talk about. Although we've got uh, you know a pretty good background of, of knowledge, uh, we say that what it's a, the important thing to start on is to know about. And so, uh, like our, our new book has got you know a chapter on genetics and a chapter on psychopathologies. Now we're not asking therapists to be experts in in that that area, but if you don't know anything about it at all, you don't know where to go. You don't know what to base it on, and it's very much the same with uh, with the uh, with the. Oh, I don't, the general public always sounds so so demeaning, but it's not. But but for the broader population, yes. And, yeah. and one thing, Sophie, that that I am very heightened. I mean, people, our listeners know that I used to be in the acting profession. I used to be in this sort of presenter position that you're in. I reckon you can tell when you have a presenter who knows what they're talking about and a presenter who is very professionally and skillfully presenting a prepared script. <laughs> and that's why we wanted to talk to you because, uh, you know, we, we were talking about you saying, Gee, that woman really knows what she's talking about. And you've actually uh, uh, put yourself at, at some risk, as we do, when you put pen to paper because you've you've done a couple of books over the years, which which I think are terrific. I, I particularly love the, the uh, road testing happiness. I find that a, a, a really valuable. I mean, it's, I, I think it's it's as, as vibrant now as it was in two 
what was it, 2010, 2011, okay. that you published it. But it was, it, it, it's great. What about writing those books? What was, what was going, what craziness was going on in your head that you thought, I'll put myself really, Out and it there. is a risk. It does put you at risk a bit, doesn't it? Or, or it, it puts you vulnerable. Well, the first one was about healthy ageing, where That's I wanted to really look at, it was really when the the anti-aging sort of phenomenon was taking off and there was a lot of sort of pseudoscience and really, really poor um, information that was being put out about what could help you um, live longer and, and age well. And so I wanted to debunk a, a fair bit of that with that first book. And then the second book, which is probably um, one that I'm that I, I'm proudest of, um, I, I wrote that um, in the wake of my mum dying because I wanted to, I've always been fascinated with, you know, positive psychology and the science of happiness and what interventions can work to boost your mood and, and make you feel better and more able to deal with the, whatever life's throwing at you. And I I just felt at that point, you know, when when the chips are down and you're in the, in the throes of grief or in the weeds of something very difficult, that's when you need to be able to call on these tools and these evidence-based tools from positive psychology and other things to really lift you out of that um, that grief. And so I was right in the weeds of that 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 grief. And so I thought, um, so for me, it was a, a sort of cathartic way to sort of work through what I was going through, but really just, you know, talk to a whole lot of people from, again, an evidence-based point of view and say, you know, what does work and how successful are these um, these measures like meditation or exercise or connecting with people or, you know, what to really help you manage your mental health when you really need it the most, when you're when you're really struggling, you know. So it's 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 one thing to sort of implement those tools when you're feeling good. Um, but it's another thing when you're not feeling so great to be able to sort of call on these techniques to say, is it going to make a difference to how I feel? And 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 I think that can be a motivating factor because sometimes when you're you're not feeling great, the last thing you feel like doing is you know doing some meditation or going for a walk and or picking up the phone and and saying I'll meet someone for coffee, even though you you know you know deep down it will make you feel better. But I wanted to look at what the evidence said and what the experts said you know would really make a difference. And um, and that was the that was the goal of that book to really to really weave the the evidence of these these different interventions through with my own story of sort of you know, grappling with grief and yeah. um, and so it's um, yeah it was a challenging book to write in some ways because it but it was cathartic and I'm the sort of person that you know when I look at different things that have happened to me particularly traumatic things I do tend to write about them as a way of almost like getting it out on paper and um in this case you know people were able to read it but you know we all you know we know that the benefits of journaling for 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 being able to process emotions is is a very powerful practice and for me it's just something that I've got the luckily had the platform to be able to turn that that sort of practice into something that can be of use for for people yeah, it's it's this thing of understanding um, things you can do, uh, but it's about getting back on track. Uh, and we talk a lot of, uh, about this. We take a little bit of time in 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 our writings. And in fact, one of my one of my things I'm most proud of is is a, a four three or four paragraphs where I take us from um, you know four point you know six billion years ago. To sort of recently, but based on uh, fabulous things and conversations with uh, guys like Joseph Ledoux and and uh, uh, various other you know fascinating um, people doing these things, uh, but understanding that our interaction with this modern world is a is a is a really confused juxtaposition because this entity, this being that that we possess, and uh, we you know certainly we we talk about genetics quite a lot and uh, how much it struggles with this world. Um, and that's one of the the difficulties as well. Some of those socio-cultural uh, mm. topics. How do you find incorporating those sorts of ideas of you know things like as you say, go up and have a bit of exercise. No one wants to do that. Whereas of course you know X number of thousands of years ago, you yeah. had to exercise in order to yeah. eat. You know. I think when you can explain to people from a sort of biological point of view, from a neuroscience point of view, that the way we live our lives at the moment is really counterintuitive to what's good for us. You know, we're not meant to be working seven days a week 
really long hours and have no periods of rest. You know, um, if you can under, if you can help people explain that that's not biologically and from a neuroscience point of view the way you, you're going to be an optimal person and perform at your highest level, we're just not built that way. We're not built to just keep going and going and going. And if you do, then you're just going to, you know, collapse at some point. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so um, I think if you can explain, and that's what I sort of aim to do in, in some of the, the posts and things I put out on social media to explain that, you know, it's not, you know, if you want to live an optimal life and and a high performing life, but you you do need to sort of think about you know rest and recovery. You do need to think about the constant um, the constant stimulation that we're that we're bombarded with. You know, and it's only when you escape from that. And if you think about when people go on holidays and have a break, often it's not that they're having a break from work so much, but it's they're having a break from that constant stimulation of like having to answer emails, having to answer phone calls, being bombarded with text messages, that you're constantly sort of on, 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 and you're in that fight or flight, your nervous system is in that fight or flight state constantly. And that's not the way we're meant to, that our bodies and our nervous system was designed to be. We're designed to be, you know, move up and down from sort of, you know, you know, your nervous system needs to be switched on every now and then to deal with things. But then we're meant to be in that more relaxed, calm state for, for you know, more of the time rather than in that fight or flight. Mm. And it's only when you get out of that fight or flight state that you think, oh, wow, I, there is a different way to feel, you know, I'm not just, and when you feel that way, then you realise, oh, I'm not snapping at the people around me like I normally do, or I'm not, you know, waking up feeling crappy every day. I'm actually feeling good. And and what's changed? And what what's often changed is that, you know, you've removed all the, the stimulus that's sort of stressing out your nervous system. And that's why some people, which is a, a good thing, some people will delete like all their social media apps on, on the weekends or on holidays just so that they're not being bombarded or, or turn off all their notifications. So we have to be proactive to, to put those boundaries in place over where our time and our energy and our focus is going because otherwise you are just constantly bombarded, you know, whether it's through emails or TV or social media and that's sort of a, that's a recipe for for burnout in a lot of ways, and that's why we're seeing um, you know a lot of burnout in a lot of professions where people are you know working really hard with a lot of stress and a lot of um, responsibilities, and they're just in that fight or flight state for so long that their bodies just go and and nervous systems go I can't handle this anymore. And I'll have to take some time out, and that's why we're seeing such um, such high rates of burnout in a lot of, particularly the caregiving professions, including psychology. We're seeing a lot of burnout in in mental health professionals, in health professionals generally, but particularly mental health professionals because everyone is rushing to them for help, and often they can, you know, people have told me they feel very overwhelmed with the demands on their time. And a lot of them have said, I can't take any more people on my books. You know, I've had to close my books. And um, and so for mental health professionals, you need to make sure you're putting those boundaries in place to protect yourself as well. Because without, if, you know, it's about putting on your own oxygen mask first. If you don't look after yourself, you can't be of any help to anybody else. Yeah, we get a lot of uh, requests and discussions about that, and it's a uh, we we try to address that in in, uh, in our profession, and it's and it is it is terribly important. I mean, the the uh, I suppose, and I know Matt, you've got something burning. I just wanted to, to say that one of the biggest problems we have with our our culture, with our mental health profession, which is what we know more about, is that in many respects the tail wags the dog, and uh, how we shift that is is a long and interesting process, but. The the, the mental health, the physical health, the, the returning to a sense of, uh, of of autonomous control begins with knowing about, which is what's so wonderful with your work. But uh, sorry, Matt, I know, I know there's something you're you're burning to ask, but I just want to yeah. jump in with that. Yeah, so so I'm keen to know because you do have this uh, sort of the big picture, and um, you're in a unique position to be able to, you know, have the sort of finger on the pulse in, in a lot of ways. What's fascinating fascinating you at the moment what's going on in in particular in mental health if I can sort of hone it into well, into that area I think in mental health 
one of the great things we've seen over the last decade or so is really um, uh, people are much more comfortable talking about mental health, which is fantastic. Mm. People are much more comfortable talking about their own issues, um, mainly on the sort of depression and anxiety side of thing. I think there's still quite a lot of stigma on the more serious mental illnesses. And, and that's great. You know, the awareness and the acceptance has been fantastic. But I think what what's missing, though, is really the services and the support for people to get the help that they need. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's it's one good thing. It's good that people are comfortable talking about how they're feeling. But, the you know, how devastating if you actually, uh, you know, realise that you need help and then you can't get it. You can't yeah. get the help that yeah. you need. Yeah, and there is. Why, yeah, that's why it's so important that people can find help through other means, whether it's through podcasts like this or, you know, through, you know, through books or, you know, evidence-based social media. Mm-hmm. Because the tools are out there and, you know, ideally, yes, of course, the, the best way is to do the one-on-one, see somebody who's who you can develop a relationship with. And But if you don't have that opportunity, then I guess you've got to look at, well, where else can I get those that, that support that I need? Where else can I get those tools and those techniques that will help me feel better and will help me be able to deal with the stress of what I'm dealing with? And so I think that that's... You know, and that's not just something that's happening in Australia. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. You know, in the UK, the NHS is overwhelmed. In the US, I've just been to the US and the lack of support for, and services for mental health is definitely a big issue there. And, and, of course, we know it's an issue in Australia, particularly what they call the missing middle in Australia, which is, you know, people who have got, um, you know, not not serious enough mental health issues to be hospitalised, but more more serious than just you know the odd visit to a GP or or a couple of sessions with a psychologist. So there's a real gap for that missing middle, mm. and that's something that's happening you know worldwide. So I think we need to look at you know meeting people where they are, and that's what I've tried to do. You know, you've got to meet the audience where they are. You know, and 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 a lot of ways the audiences are they're listening to podcasts and. Yep. And they're in the way that people used to read newspapers and used to sit down and, and watch the the news, the nightly news. They're now going on social media. They're going to podcasts to find that information that they want. And so, just like you are with this podcast, you've got to meet meet people where they are to give them the information that they want and that they need. And so, um, I really, I, it's been quite good in a lot of ways to see the quality of information that is being put out through some social media. I mean, not all, obviously you can't, you know, you can't generalize, but um, you know, there is some very good quality information being put out through Instagram and through LinkedIn to have to get, give people the tools that they need to, to manage their mental health. And I think that's been a, a, a good development. Yeah, you did. I was just going to say just quickly about the the because one of the symptoms of overwhelm is the lack of uh, of, of ability of self efficacy, as, as Bandura says, and uh, you know Marty Seligman in Positive mm-hmm. Psychology who talks about uh, learned helplessness. But we also need to understand for every for learned helplessness, we have the opposite uh, into learn helpfulness, and it's exactly as you say. But uh, but that's that's one of the big things I just wanted to highlight. There is that if you're out there and, and these people and they're feeling overwhelmed and I can't do it, mm. um, that's that is actually. Exactly right. That's exactly what our <laughs> biology has been organised forever. We get mm-hmm. to a point where we can't do it. We then go to see the, the, the Uncle Ma- uh, Uncle Barry or Aunt Mary in the local village, and and they, you know, we do their garden and they help us. And these things have been lost. That mm-hmm. that. Uh, but it's also the talking over the back fence. It's also chatting over the coffee. And that's where our podcasts and our um, uh, journalistic repre- representations and your your posts in LinkedIn mm-hmm. and uh, all those sorts of things give people uh, uh, that accessible first step of saying, oh, I can do that. Mm. And and then then at least you are in the possibility of starting the, the, the series of steps that, that bring them back to self-efficacy. 
And I think people really like, and one thing I've really tried to uh, focus on is explaining, you know, explaining um, why you might be feeling a certain way, like with feeling overwhelmed, but then giving some practical tips on what to do about it, because it's all well and good to know, oh, okay, now I, that sounds like me, I'm feeling overwhelmed, but what do you actually do to feel better? What's the first step? And so just a little techniques like thinking about, you know, and I use this as well, thinking about, you know, what are all your responsibilities you've got for that week and what can I delay? I'm a, you know, what can I ditch and what can I delegate? You know, what can I pass off to somebody else that I don't need to do? I don't need to be handling that. Give it to somebody else to do. What can I, you know, kick down the road to the next few weeks or what can I um, get rid of completely? Because often, you know, we we actually have more control than we realise. And when you sit down to and I, I recommend for some people who are feeling overwhelmed and burnt out to do a stress audit. Like what are all the things that are causing you to feel stressed at work, at home, in your relationships? And then look at look at all those things and think about, you know, where can you, what can you get rid of? What can you delegate? What can you um, delay? And by even just by taking that first step, you know, just taking action will make you feel better. And and it's also uh, having the associates and the connections. You don't need many uh, because I was just thinking, Matt and I do that a lot. Uh, You know, we'll we'll just sort of say, oh, look, you know, I've got these things to do. Could you do that? Uh, And this happens, uh, I suppose you've got your partner. Um, in, in a relationship and to some extent the, the broader family you know maybe you've got older kids but even younger kids you know say hey you know you go out and do the washing up or I don't know exactly um, I've got four boys actually my husband and I've got four kids and so um, we always we sort of wanted to raise them in that way where you know it wasn't just the, the parents doing everything but everyone was contributing and mm-hmm. and I've, we've only got one son living at home but a, a great example was the other night um, my husband and I sort of started to cook the dinner, but then we got tied up doing something. And then one of my sons and his boyfriend just sort of took over and finished cooking the dinner, you know, without having to be asked. They just did it. They just saw that, you know, we were busy doing something else and then they just took over. And it was a great example of just, you know, raising children to be, you know, have that self-efficacy and to sort of to, to want to contribute and want to be part of a of that the family group and, um, and, and seeing that there was an, you know, a need and just taking action. And so that was a, a gratifying, you know, parental moment. So you have to, you know, hold on to those after yeah. going through the difficult teenage years. It's like, right, okay, that works. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Can, I, can I just take you back to um, just talking about the need for mental health intervention? And you did mention apps like when we first started talking, and I'm just wondering what's happening um, in that realm of using applications as an extension to therapeutic intervention? Look, there's really an overwhelming number of apps that are available. <clears throat> and I think one of the downsides is there's not a lot of oversight of how useful they are but um, that is something that the in Australia the Australian Commission on Quality and Safety in Healthcare have developed some guidelines and some sort of standards on digital mental health which is actually really helpful because you don't really know if you purchase one of these apps whether they're actually going to make a difference or not Mm. Um, having said that if, if if you find it works for you then, it, then it's worthwhile, but it, it would be nice to see a, a bigger uptake of these sort of standards so that you would know, okay, this, this app has sort of got that tick of approval that it's got some scientific rigour behind it. It's been tested and um, because especially with the for-profit companies that are putting out apps, you don't really know whether you're going to get the benefit that they are saying you'll get. So I always like to use apps that uh, have a, a basis in research and that that have been developed by, you know, um, mental health research organisations because they've done they've done all the testing in the real life, you know, with real life people before the app comes out. So I tend to preference those and prefer to use those rather than ones that are just, you know, a company setting up an app saying, you know, try yeah. this, use it. Yeah, I remember there was um, some brain training apps and when we looked into the, you know, the research as to how effective they were. They were they were effective um, in getting you to be better at the actual, you know, things that you were doing uh, within the yeah. app, but there wasn't a lot of, you know, um, knock-on effect. Yes, and if you if you do Sudoku puzzles, then you become very good at doing Sudoku puzzles. And yeah. That's about it. I mean, we we've been uh, we do a lot 
in our work with with therapists, but we've just brought out a, a, a we're, we're progressively releasing a series we call the Brain and You, which is just talking about um, bits and pieces in the brain, things that are happening, uh, even social stuff. But again, in that 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 area that you're talking about, where where both the, the the wider public, but I think also a lot of therapists who are very, very good at methods, but actually not really good at understanding the biological stuff going on. And it's so important between. to understand, if you understand the biology and the neuroscience, then a lot of it makes a lot more sense all of a sudden. Mm. It really does. And that's what I find people say to me. They're like, oh, now I understand now because you, you've explained how that works with the amygdala and you've explained in, in that post, you know, why this happens. So just understand, getting that background and understanding the sort of context can make a really big difference. And it doesn't mean yeah. you need to be, you know, overwhelmed by the science or de- delve too deeply into, you know, why the brain does what it does, but it just gives you that little bit of insight. Mm. And um, so, and then you can yeah. pair that with the practical tools that that obviously will make a difference as well. So I think that combination can be very powerful for, for people to have the, the scientific understanding plus the practical tools to feel better. And um, and I think that that's what that's what people want. You know, they want to understand, they want to know that that there is a reason why they feel a certain way. And they also want some things that they can just sort of, you know, hold on to and think on a difficult day, I'm going to pull out these little tips and mm. put into practice. Yeah, and yeah. You know, I think that that makes a big difference. And, you know, one thing, you know, even when I, Richard, when I wrote my book about um, road testing happiness, I wrote about meditation and how the, the science, we know the science of meditation is overwhelming, how good it is for your brain. And But I really struggled back then, even back then, t- to meditate. And it's only really been in the last two or three years that I've really got into meditation. And, be, and it's because I delved more into the science of the impact of breathing on your nervous system and right. understanding that that one of the only things you can do to calm your nervous system from that fight or flight into that more relaxed nervous system is by doing those deep breathing exercises. You can't think your way out of feeling anxious and your heart racing. You have to do a, bod- a bodily practice to downregulate and to relax your nervous system, uh, and then it, and meditation and deep breathing, it's that's the switch that flicks you into that state. Yeah, and it's so frustrating how long it takes. I mean, you, you've certainly been researching these things and going, but, but <laughs> what you're vaguely talking about there, amongst other things, is is uh, vagal tone of uh, Stephen exactly. Porges and his work. And uh, you know, I, we've known Stephen since the, the mid '90s, and uh, and it's sort of like, why don't people listen? Um, exactly. But, well, but, I but think we get there. You, yeah, once you realise though that you know, and I say to people like you know, anxiety, for example. You think it's all up in your head, anxiety, but if you think about it, it's actually in your body where you feel it. You know, you have the heart racing, you might be shaking, you have the sweaty palms. It's very much a physiological reaction. So you have to, so if you can use your body to to counter it, it's going to be much more effective than just trying to outthink anxiety. And yes. so your anxiety is your body telling you to do these things to to calm down, not telling you that the, it's, we, we talk about this a lot, the, 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 uh, the symptom, my, my mentor, a guy known as Rossi, had a wonderful book called The Symptom Path to Enlightenment. Uh, okay. rather than the symptom path to, my God, you're terrible and you're in a horrible way and you're never <laughs> going to get better and a hell me, you better, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, but just uh, sort of getting up, getting a bit silly. The, but the, uh, I mean, you've been doing your work and, and you're talking here and you're, you're saying, you know, and you're extending into blogs and, and social media. But the ABC, you've been, how much have you been involved in some of these specials that the ABC are doing? Uh, and are there more coming? I, I, I think we, I don't want to miss out on uh plugging what we're doing there on the abc because that's that i saw the last one it was really reliable very very good yeah so abc has really made a big effort to make mental health something that we've had a, a whole across the abc focus so a couple of years in a row we've run um we've run programs across abc during mental health month and um and we we do have something coming up that it's not just on mental health, but it's on health generally. Yeah. And it's very much, you know, just a little sort of can't say too much about it, but a little sort of sneak peek. It's it's very much based on what can you do to improve your own health. So it's about empowering people to take action themselves, which I, I think is 
really fantastic. It's about looking at, you know, what can you do on an individual level uh, to, to feel better every day? And so um, that's that's the focus of our, that's going to be the focus this, this year across the ABC rather than, um, and, and mental health is obviously a big, big part of that. It will, it will uh, cascade out of it. I mean, we, one of the, our earliest chapters uh, in the, you know, the few books we've done is we've got to shift out of this um, uh, restrictive linear thinking into a more complex understanding that if you make a change here, then that cascades out all over the place. And uh, mm-hmm. if you talk yeah. about mental health for a while, well, that will start to cascade down into physical health. You talk about physical health because, uh, surprisingly enough, this thing between our head and our <laughs> shoulders is hollow and has stuff going up and down. And, so, so. and it's all linked. And I think, um, yeah. I mean, that's one of the great things, though, with these interventions. You know, I did, I did an event the other day about Alzheimer's and dementia prevention, and they were talking, the, the, the neurologists in that um, conference were talking about what you can do to prevent dementia. And... Interestingly, brain training was very low down the list when it came to evidence, but very high up the list with things like dietary interventions and exercise and um, those sort of things. And so, and the benefits of those, obviously, if you're eating well and and getting some exercise, you're not only going to prevent dementia, but you're going to boost your mental health as well. And so you get almost like you do, you know, one intervention, but you have multiple benefits as a result. And I think it's good for people to recognise that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we did a uh, documentary recently uh, on the gut, brain you know connection and the gut microbiome how important that is and we talked to some researchers in alzheimer's and yeah your your gut is just essential and uh, yeah and they were they were so interesting it was was. a fascinating topic a fascinating area yeah yeah. fantastic sophie we're coming to the end of our chat is there anything you'd like to um sort of leave us with today um, look, I just I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity and and you know congratulations on the podcast and and I'm sure it's a great value to your listeners. Um, I just you know I, I guess often people think that you know mental health is something that is sort of hidden away and and it's great that we're now talking about it and I think that if we can if we can empower people to take action themselves and think about you know what can what small step that can I take today that's going to make me feel better not only today but in the ongoing days and often yeah. it's not about radically overhauling your whole life it's about taking these little small actions but all, but being consistent and I think that's something that people in a lot of ways they want to you know do big take radical action but it's not about radical actions it's about actually small little steps but doing it on a consistent basis and that's where you change your brain chemistry that's where you start to repattern you know your brain and get rid of old stories that you've been telling yourself all these years and so think about um what 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 small action you could take today whether it's you know doing a meditation or you know taking your dog for a walk or or ringing up a friend and arranging to connect with someone you haven't seen for a while, those little actions, doing things like that, that's what sees the big transformation. Small things consistently, then that's how you transform your mental health and your physical health and become the best version of yourself. And that is, yes, and immediately translatable to the therapist. In what way can a therapist help someone take those small steps? Stop going for radical, uh, all that stuff for the the wider population, for the therapist population. And uh, uh, what a beautiful message. Uh, And Sophie, we just thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And uh, little, little, little tufty tops of a dog. Oh, here's Uh, Sammy. Hi, Sammy. You were good. You like to be part of everything. There we go. Yeah, but uh, and another wonderful <laughs> thing, uh, another wonderful thing for for people to have people those who who are alone. I have a uh, some wonderful grief patients who an animal has been the most extraordinary benefit. Yeah. So all well, these things, your nervous system, they uh, they instantly calm your nervous system. Uh, pets, so yes. yeah. 
Yes, tap straight into your vagus <laughs> nerve. They're beautiful. So <laughs> we just want to say thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you doing lots and lots of things. Now, uh, uh, for people, we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, you've got a website, which has got fabulous things and additional things. We'll have uh, a link to that on our show notes because uh, you get your own page uh, on on the with your, your fabulous podcast here. Uh, but also uh, some things with the ABC, some links there so that people can follow you. And also your LinkedIn uh, uh, mm-hmm. link is good. Uh, people connect in there because there's some wonderful posts. I keep up with them as, as often as I can. Thanks, Rich. And I really appreciate it. And, and keep up the great work, both of you. Um, it's just such a valuable thing you're doing for mental health. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Sophie. See you then. Bye. Bye.